The seventh generation of consoles is one that is very special to me. I love that this generation didn't really define my childhood as much as it did my adolescence. More nights were spent blowing up virtual enemies than I would ever care to admit, and I still talk to people I met on Xbox Live to this day. The sales war of the seventh generation, however, was not a close one. Nintendo's crack at motion controls left an enormous impact in the cultural consciousness of the public. Over 100 million Wiis were sold, an astronomical number. Families that didn't house gamers owned a Nintendo Wii. It was the perfect storm of marketing, affordability, and good software. It's tough to say if we'll ever see lightning in a bottle to the same degree as the Wii's success. The second of the three, in terms of sales, was Microsoft's Xbox 360, a console that helped shepherd in a new perspective on video games, the social one. Launching at $400, 150 more than the Wii, and 100 less than its Sony branded competitor, the 360 fit the mold for the gamer who wanted a high definition experience without any hassle. While the 360 sold 84 million systems worldwide, it didn't have nearly the cultural impact in Japan as the Wii did. What it did do in the West, however, is start bringing gamers together with its, with its revolutionary Xbox Live system. Finally, Sony entered the battle with their PlayStation 3, the next iteration of the most popular console of the previous generation. Developing for this console was apparently a nightmare, which resulted in it housing the worst of multi-platform releases. Games that would perform excellently on the 360 wouldn't always do the same on the PS3. This wasn't always the case though, and the PS3 was a worthwhile beast if it could be tamed. It housed superior tech specs to any other competitor, and when it was reined in by developers such as Naughty Dog, it created some of the most technically impressive games we had ever seen. In terms of influence, it's hard for me to say any other console than Microsoft's 360. Having owned all three at some point, I found that I was playing my 360 far more than any other console for the sole reason of how easy it was to play with my friends. The culture of Xbox Live became so apparent that it is forever immortalized in young people's hearts. The days of entering a multiplayer lobby where everyone had their microphone plugged in was a tremendous time, and the things I heard I could never repeat to my mother, someone I hear they were quite familiar with. But this isn't a video on consoles. Sure, they're important to understanding the relevance of the games we'll discuss, but I'm far more interested in the most influential games of the seventh generation. To me, the answer of which game is the most influential is pretty clear and obvious, it's not even close. I imagine many of you will agree, while some may not. But today, we're going to discuss the games that defined a generation, as well as their long-lasting impact on game design today. I'm David, and this is Game Study. I guess it's important that we establish some vocabulary here. There's no way this analysis doesn't make someone mad, but I will try and reduce the blow. When I write influential, I mean the design decisions of one game that encouraged other games to include that design decision. Take for example Mario 64, one of the most influential games of all time. After the release of this game on the N64, the genre of collectathon was born. It created a genre. Not only that, but it redefined mascot platformers for every video game developer afterwards. Games after included the same design decisions such as gated content behind collectible goals, as well as open three-dimensional spaces to explore and platform on. There's an obvious shift in video game development pre-Super Mario 64 and post-Super Mario 64. This can be found in other games such as Wolfenstein 3D in regards to first-person shooters, or Grand Theft Auto 3 in regards to open worlds. So when we talk about a game being influential, I don't exactly mean just sales or just cultural impact. A good example is a game series I won't be including, Grand Theft Auto. GTA 5 was the highest selling game for both the PS3 and the 360, but it won't be making the video. It was iterative. The standard was already there. The fifth game just improved upon what GTA 4 and 3 had already accomplished. The game was great, and it performed great, but it was not as influential in its design. I feel the same way about games such as Bioshock, Mass Effect, and Skyrim. As great as these games were, they were the ones being influenced, not doing the influencing. So it's not just sales, it's not just popularity, and it's certainly not a list of the best games of the last generation. We're talking about the paradigm shift in terms of video game design that comes after the release of the title. That being said, this isn't BuzzFeed. I won't be making a top 10 list. This is a discussion. I want to start that discussion with the topic of game maps, as well as the idea of an open world. 
I would encourage you to grab any open world game released today. Open up the map. What you're immediately met with is an overwhelming amount of icons. A colorful display of spilled emblems that encourage you to help this man or participate in this race or kill this dude for doing that thing. How did this happen? The ubiquity of open world content is an epidemic. Hours and hours of checklist material that artificially increases your playtime. Who do we blame? Personally off the record here, I kind of like it. The catharsis and checking off the checklists and collecting things is sort of intoxicating to me. But yeah, pitchforks. Who do we blame for this? I think we have to go no further than Montreal to visit Ubisoft and the development team behind Assassin's Creed. Now this choice wasn't really difficult for me. While I don't think this is the most influential title of the 7th generation, I do think it might be a worthy runner-up. What was difficult, however, was picking between this and the second game, Assassin's Creed 2, which refined many of the problems the first game had and also added a closer idea of what we know open worlds to be today. Regardless, the idea is there. No other game had you climbing towers to unlock parts of the map, which would just open up more stuff for you to do. Its design was viral from this point on. The incessant need to pick up the scattered icons was tremendous, and game developers quickly picked up on it. Even Zelda Breath of the Wild, maybe one of the most influential franchises, picked up on the Ubisoft Tower idea just this year. Look, love or hate the series, you cannot deny the impact Ubisoft map design has had on the industry. And that all started with Assassin's Creed. Now you may be thinking, well a lot of the games that include that design are Ubisoft titles. Far Cry, Watch Dogs, and while it is true that a lot of Ubisoft games incorporate this, it is dishonest to believe it hasn't leaked into other developers. Middle Earth, Shadow of Mordor has you scaling towers, completing side objectives, and clearing checklists like there's no tomorrow. Batman Arkham Knight has watchtowers and side objectives. Avalanche Studios' Mad Max has an almost identical open world design. Pop dying light into your system and think about how the map design is derivative of the Ubisoft formula to this day. Some might remember Infamous or Prototype, maybe The Saboteur, Just Cause, Mirror's Edge Catalyst. Even Grand Theft Auto doubled down on this map design, giving the player more icons on the map than ever before. I tend to call this kind of game design mowing, like mowing the lawn. While I like doing it, there's one monumental problem with it. It's brainless, you're not connecting with the navigation. When you add the mini-map or guidance arrows, you are systematically mowing the map's lawn. That's <laughs> so dumb. When you really dig into it though, Assassin's Creed was the catalyst for more than just the open world. Magnetic climbing sections such as the one seen in Uncharted and Tomb Raider games? Check. Parkour? Check. Eagle Vision? The Last of Us says check. Trust me, I understand. I understand we don't want to give much credit to one of the most iterative franchises of all time, but den denying Assassin's Creed impact on game design is a foolish effort. The next game was difficult for me, but I feel it necessary to include. Remember, these aren't really in any order. Look, I'm just going to say it. Gears of War, the first one. The one-button cover shooter. Ignore everything about the game, the masculinity, the chainsaw gun, whatever. Just imagine in your head Marcus sticking to the chest-high cover like it's a magnet. That design decision alone permeated itself into so many titles over the years, the gamers have begun to all but reject its place. And it's not just the mechanic, it's the level design too. When you add this mechanic again, it shapes the way the developers have to think about combat arenas. Now in cover shooters, you can immediately tell when there's going to be a gunfight because there's chest high cover everywhere, or pillars. It's comical sometimes. Gears came out in 2006, and the list of games go on and on that incorporate these cover mechanics. The immediate ones that come to mind are Grand Theft Auto, Mass Effect, Uncharted, Splinter Cell Conviction, Watch Dogs, Rainbow Six Vegas. Okay, that's not even close to the amount, and I'm sure you could add more. Gears didn't add a lot in the ways of storytelling or theme, that's for sure, but there is an undeniable difference in the history of game development from when that game wasn't out to when it was. This is another design that has just become so ubiquitous that it's become as understood of a game mechanic as jumping or shooting. This is to say that when a gamer has even played a cursory amount of video games, picks up a cover shooter game, a title that exists mainly in part to Gears of War, they would just know most of the buttons and controls immediately without a tutorial. Honorable mentions for Gears could also be the gritty, sort of beautiful destruction aesthetic that became trendy in games for a couple years after the first game's release. The third and penultimate game I want to discuss here was difficult for me to include, and not because I don't think it's worthy, but that I'm not sure if it qualifies, due to the nature of its release structure and origins. That being said, I think I could be convinced that this game is the most influential of the last generation. 
I don't really believe that right now, but the crater it left in terms of what we understood a video game to be is massive. We've all stayed up all night playing it at least once. Minecraft. Mojang's sandbox crafting title is such a cultural icon, such a massive success that many people who have never played a video game in their life have played this game. It's infiltrated every child's consciousness and has obliterated any preconception of the audience that video games are for. My grandmother has played Minecraft. There are no gender boundaries, no age boundaries. It was an objectively fresh and subjectively fun experience that sparked such a tsunami of copycats that it's hard to find early access games without crafting mechanics. It's almost as if developers include crafting mechanics so that the word craft takes some sort of Pavlovian neural node that makes 10 year olds froth at the mouth. The reason I was hesitant to include this is because it was a PC game originally, and those are always harder to pin console generations on. That being said, it came out on these consoles and millions played them. The ensuing wealth of open world, procedurally generated survival games has drowned the Steam marketplace with crap, giving games, gamers such fatigue on anything to do with open-ended player freedom. Mechanics such as punching trees, building bases, digging holes, and crafting objects have found their way into so many different games since Minecraft's release. There was an immediate gold rush to incorporate Minecraft-like elements into every single game. To be honest, there isn't much more to say on this one, mainly because if you were watching this video, you have seen it with your own eyes. Minecraft shifted the gaming landscape. Before we get into what I think the most influential game of the seventh generation is, I figured I would throw in some honorable mentions. First, I feel it necessary to mention Jonathan Blow's Braid, and the impact it had on indie-developed content as well as downloadable content. Braid emboldened a generation of indie developers to take risks and create sort of non-traditional games. I thought I should also include at least one Valve game, but I'm torn between Portal and Left 4 Dead. The former being similar to Braid in that it showed developers that it's possible to make compelling video games and small packages that take risks. It was also revolutionary in its approach to storytelling in a video game. Left 4 Dead helped make four-player co-op a staple of these sorts of games, and its, and its system of changing the level in the horde based on how you are performing was not necessarily new, but very cool. I'm willing to include Demon Souls or Dark Souls, though I tend to not talk about these games because I know nothing about them. I fear angering the base. The game's approach to stamina management has been copied relentlessly. And my approach to Nintendo is lacking, for sure, but I would also be open to including Super Mario Galaxy, a new approach to the platformer formula. Alright now, what game from Generation 7 has design decisions that can be found in a majority of games coming out, even today? Call of Duty 4 Modern Warfare. The prince of progression systems, the king of killstreaks. Though whether you not like it or not, most influential game of Generation 7. There's not a shooter or action game since the release of COD 4 that does not include a progression system. What used to be considered reserved for role-playing titles, leveling up now must be included in any title that wants its players to return. This was not the case before COD 4, as hard to believe as that is. Games didn't used to bombard you with unlocks. Points wouldn't explode onto your screen at the moment you accomplish even the most menial of tasks. Furthermore, no one had really done the whole create a class system yet. No first person shooter was gating content behind experience walls. Killstreaks? Previous to 2007, that word didn't hold the meaning it does now. Call of Duty 4 accomplished more than just game design influence though. It created a culture, a culture of Xbox Live lobbies, a culture of YouTube gaming, and that's not hyperbole. Call of Duty 4 was the first game that was being widely ingested by viewers on YouTube. It helped create the first YouTube gaming celebrity. It built careers. Hell, I can even say quickscoping and you automatically have an image in your head of the act itself or the person that would ever say that word unironically. It spurred into action such a massive and monolithic icon of gaming that would go on to annualize its releases and become literally the best-selling entertainment franchise in the world. Maybe you had to have been there. In a world dominated by World War II shooters, COD 4 broke the mold and created something that no one else knew they wanted. After that game, we couldn't escape the modern military shooter. Everyone followed suit. Everyone copied. No one could topple Infinity Ward's beast, though. When I started seeing plus 50 pop up after every kill I got in even non-shooters, I knew that we could never return to a pre-COD 4 time. When every game I got had killstreaks, had a creative class system, had a gray modern setting, and had unlockable titles and weapon skins, I knew that Infinity Ward had accomplished something special. In a lot of ways though, the impact COD 4 had was so ubiquitous, it's hard to describe specifically each influence. 
I'm confident saying pre-COD 4 game design was absolutely a different time. As always, I want to thank you guys so much for watching. A video like this is difficult because there's really no amount of time that you could possibly have to justify anything because everyone's going to have a different opinion. I know this one was a little bit different, but I thought it was a good way to skirt over a lot of game design influences rather than explore in depth just one. Let me know if you like this video or this approach or what I could do differently. Criticism helps me a lot. Go ahead and let me know if you made it this far on Twitter or in the comments section and click the like button and subscribe if you're interested in more. Next video is another long form analysis, but not really on video games. You'll see. Thanks and have a great night.